So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is David Wilkins. I'm the faculty director of the Center on the Legal Profession. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the kind of series that we've been have, trying to have at least a couple of times uh, over the year. And that is to bring the best of academic knowledge and research about critical issues in the profession to the profession and to engage in a dialogue uh, with people, not just in the legal profession, but professionals who are uh, facing some of the same challenges. And uh, today we are very delighted that we have a terrific uh, panel and speaker here for you. Uh, let me just say a few words uh, about the center and about our mission and uh, by way of an invitation uh, to have you engage with us. And I hope after this session you will think this is exactly the kind of thing we need at a school like Harvard, where we have a wonderful convening power and terrific students, and some of our students are in the room. Uh, but we're also trying to be a good citizen of the community and of the profession. And so Boston is a thriving legal market in the Northeast, as uh, uh, including New York and Washington and many other great communities. And this is a time of tremendous challenges for our uh, profession. I think everyone is trying to think what are the next steps? Where do we go from here? And how do we uh, work together to find some of the answers to the challenges? And at the center, we are committed to the idea that it's only by working together, by getting the best ideas mm -hmm. from practice and the best ideas from the academy, the best ideas from established leaders of the profession, like you'll be hearing from in a, in a second, uh, but also the best ideas from our students, because uh, many of these are challenges that, quite frankly, are going to be solved by having the new ideas coming up from the young people in the profession. Um, that's why we try to put on a number of such events a year. Uh, we also put out a digital magazine called The Practice, which you'll see there's a little flyer of on your chair, which also tries to do this, which tries to bring some of the research that we've been doing or others that we've come across have been doing uh, and to put it in a broader context around an issue in which we do interviews with leading professionals, bring in voices from outside the legal profession, and really try to foster a real dialogue and debate on some of these critical issues. So uh, I hope that this won't be the last time we see all of you, and I hope that uh, you will continue to be engaged with us, because that's the way we're going to make uh, progress on these terrific issues. Uh, today, we are talking about one issue that I think uh, everybody, every lawyer, every institution, every professional I know is struggling with, which is how to get professionals to collaborate more effectively. Um, it's maybe not surprising that in an educational system in which we pretty much reward people for individual achievement, and if people work together, as I often tell my students, we typically call it cheating, <laughs> and yet we then drop them in an environment in which they not only do work together, they have to work together if they're going to accomplish any of the goals for their organizations, for their clients, or even for themselves. Um, and increasingly, they have to collaborate across a much wider array of people and interests. So the legal profession is increasingly diverse, but more importantly, lawyers are working collaboratively with people from many other professional disciplines, and it's not just a local or a national phenomenon, it's a global one. And many of the organizations we will hear from in a minute are themselves global. Uh, that's why we are so thrilled at the center to be collaborating with Heidi Gardner, uh, who you will hear from in a minute, and who's written uh, the most important book uh, that's been written on this subject to date. It's getting lots and lots of well-deserved attention, and we have the great privilege of having Heidi say a few words about her research. 
uh, but then also to engage in a panel discussion with uh, leaders, not just in the legal profession and from many different parts of the legal profession, uh, but from other uh, parts of the professional service world as well. You've got all of their bios, so I won't repeat them. I'll just kind of in order that we have them there. It's Rita Sengupta will be kind of leading and moderating, then Mandy DeFilippo, uh, next to her is, oh, I, I skipped Roger Meltzer. How can I skip my friend Roger Meltzer? Roger Meltzer is next door, then Mandy, then Jeff Karp, and then finally uh, Susan Giannino. So uh, please uh, help me to welcome them to the stage and I'll turn it over to Heidi. So thank you. Thank you, David. I wanted to say a special thanks to the Center on Legal Profession. Um, in particular, Hakeem and Nathan have done a great job of organizing us for tonight, and uh, the Executive Education Group as well is co-sponsoring tonight. They are not just here tonight. They've been here for years behind me. Uh, sponsoring my research in many really important ways, helping me get access to the kinds of organizations that I study, uh, giving me a platform to talk about early stage research when it felt quite risky and I was still trying to try out these ideas and the opportunity to engage with people who are wrestling with these challenges day in, day out really helped to strengthen my research. So I appreciate that a lot. It turns out, uh, I didn't really know this when I started researching the topic of collaboration, it's actually a hugely risky topic to write about. Because when people talk about collaboration, they tend to think of it as a soft topic. Sort of big group hugs and kumbaya. The number of organizations I talk to that say something like, oh, we're great at collaboration. We do happy hour every Friday. <laughs> I said, well, okay, so, relationships, the kind of relationships that often get cemented over a drinks event, those are important foundations because trust is absolutely essential to collaboration, but it's not quite the same kind of collaboration that we're talking about. And so what we were able to do, actually I keep saying the word we, I should pause for a minute. Anybody who writes a book about collaboration and pretends to have done it herself is a complete hypocrite. Um, the first few pages of the book, in fact, are dedicated to naming people by name. A number of you are in there by name um, who have really helped along the way, pushing my thinking, analyzing data, uh, collecting stories, uh, giving access, all sorts of things. So together, we have built this database and analyzed it and crunched the numbers. And we try to bring hard evidence to what's otherwise seen as a soft topic. And um, I promised my team that I would not show any slides tonight. So I'm not gonna show you the data. In fact, I'm not even gonna dig into it too much, but I'll point you to you know, the first couple of chapters in the book where we present a lot of the empirical evidence, really trying to dig in and show what are the effects of collaboration? When you've got two people who are otherwise by you know, virtually every characteristic, professional and personal, look like twins, and yet one of them is tremendously collaborative, and the other one has a small network of people that they interact with, and they run it on kind of a hub and spoke system where anytime anyone has a question, it's gotta go through them. If you compare outcomes, business outcomes, commercial outcomes for those two individuals, we can show that there are tremendous benefits for the one who is much more collaborative. And we take that up a level and we look at the kind of group that they're working in, the business unit or the department. We take it up a level, we look at the firm. Across all of these different levels, what we find is that there are tremendous benefits of collaboration that go way beyond group hugs and happy hours. Those are important, but you know, revenues and profits, retaining talent, attracting millennials, engaging people, getting them to be more productive and satisfied with the work that they do. There are tremendous outcomes. And now I think uh, for perhaps the first time, we have empirical data to help us understand what that looks like. And you know, for people who know the lawyer crowd quite well, the good news is lawyers respond to evidence, right? Um, and so whether we're talking to, uh, to, you know, to a, a broad-based crowd or talking to lawyers in particular, being able to marshal evidence and show that uh, the power of collaboration is something that we've worked really hard on. There's another risk of collaboration, though, and um, aside from being seen as a soft topic, a lot of people might look at collaboration as a passing fad. 
you know, it's become such a buzzword these days. It's, a, you know, books and magazines and all over the place. And for a lot of people who don't believe in collaboration or don't want to pay attention to it, they kind of think that they can keep their head down and it will just pass right over them and tomorrow the next fad will come and replace it. Well, with our research team, we've uncovered two trends. And I'll, I'll just finish by wrapping up uh, by telling you these two trends. If you are in an environment that you think this doesn't apply, I would love to hear from you. We're trying to find the sort of boundary conditions of, of our ideas. Um, and so if, if this doesn't work for you, let me know. Um, but we think that these two trends in most arenas are accelerating and they're crashing together. And these two trends, the collision of these two trends are what we believe makes collaboration more important today than it was last week and will continue to be so. The first of these trends is specialization. So as an academic, that's absolutely the case, but that's been the case for a long time. Academics get, uh, as they say, you know, narrower and narrower until they know everything about nothing. Um, so specialization is true in academia, but we think we're seeing it in a lot of other regions as well. Last week, I had the privilege uh, on my book tour of visiting several different government agencies in Washington, DC. And I was talking in, in one of these, uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement uh, Network, FinCEN, was asking them, so they're a Department of the Treasury, and I said, don't know much about Treasury. Is this idea of specialization true for you too? And the one guy raises his hand with the best example I've heard so far. He said, yes, so I'm an expert in Mexican drug cartels, and I have to work with my colleague because she does these cross-border arms trade, something or other, he went on, you know, and then there's the money laundering person. When the three of us get together, then we can really, you know, crack some, you know, catch the bad guys, is what he said. Okay, interesting example. I think in medicine, the trend has been very clear. Uh, people used to be sort of general physicians, and they've specialized and specialized. As one of my colleagues in the, in the med school here says often, you used to have ear, nose, and throat doctors, and now you have left earlobe doctors, mm -hmm. right? I mean, people are very specialized. And we, we see that happening across all knowledge-based industries. Because knowledge is changing so quickly, people need to capture the domain where they claim expertise and continually focus in order to stay at the top of their game. That's one of the trends we're seeing is specialization. Another one of the trends that we're seeing, though, which makes specialization somewhat problematic or creates the need for collaboration, is that our problems around us are big, broad, and multidisciplinary. All right, so I don't know if you're familiar with the term VUCA. I see some people nodding their heads. You've started to read about this. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. V-U-C-A, VUCA. Uh, it's a term, from what I understand, that originated in the US Army War College. Uh, soon after the collapse of the Soviet Union, US military strategists started to describe their world as VUCA because it was so hard for them to understand the, where the next threat was coming from. Right? There used to be the other superpower, and now all of a sudden, you know, fragmented enemies, non-state actors, all kinds of, uh, of threats coming from different places. And I suspect every time our phone goes off and the Twitter account buzzes, we feel the same way. It's a pretty VUCA environment that we're living in today. It doesn't matter if you're talking about globalization or geopolitics or the business environment. Uh, our problems are big and broad and multidisciplinary. So when you put those two trends together, those big, broad problems, deep, narrow experts, that's the argument for why collaboration matters. It's more than big group hugs. It's the combination or integration of specialized expertise to tackle complicated, important, high-value problems that none of us could do alone, no matter how smart or hardworking we are. So that's the idea behind collaboration. We've called the book Smart Collaboration. It's meant to poke people a little bit to think about when collaboration is versus isn't a smart idea. If you don't know why you're collaborating, it might not be a good idea because teamwork can be risky and costly and inefficient. But there are times, like I'm saying, with these VUCA problems and, uh, and the integration of specialized knowledge to tackle them, that's the real argument for when collaboration is smart. So over to you, Rena. Great. Thank you, Heidi. 
So <clears throat> I think I'm a, I'm a specialist, unfortunately. I, I specialise in legal innovation, which for many people could be a very narrow discipline. It's getting, getting broader all the time. So I've known Heidi oh, for a number of years now. It, it dates back to probably four or five years. And I got fascinated by Heidi's work because um, she was sort of proving how important collaboration was to business performance within uh, professional service firms. And I was, at the time, we've been running a huge program with the Financial Times looking at legal innovation. And um, we were realizing that collaboration was such a, a critical driver of innovation in professional service firms. So our findings very much were mirroring um, Heidi's research findings too. So we kind of collaborated, <laughs> came together, and, and, and been sort of watching what each other's been doing. Um, quite closely. So I'm really delighted to chair this, this panel. Um, and I guess my, my, for, for what it's worth, I mean, we, we see it as so important. So with the, with the FT, um, we've decided to, we, we publish three reports on legal innovation a year. Um, one is in covers the Asia Pacific uh, profession, the North American profession and the European profession, including the UK at the moment. And what we, uh, what we are going to do is actually put a whole segment on collaboration in there because we think that that's how we're going to find some interesting examples of innovation. And the universe in which um, uh, lawyers are collaborating is expanding all the time. You know, we're seeing clients driving collaborations between their law firms. We're seeing better collaborations internally. Um, and it's a, it's a very sort of exciting place to be. It, but as... Um, as Heidi says, uh, it is a risky topic because I think within many law firms, it is still seen as a soft topic. Although I was kind of gratified in um, we get sort of 1,500 odd submissions a year. And last year, I think we had five or six uh, from different law firms around the world, from a firm in Austria and a firm in the States and various firms. And, um, and all citing Heidi's work as a kind of stimulus uh, for them beginning to collaborate more. And, you know, so firms doing things like collaboration contests and, um, you know, and the amount of times I got asked last year, do you know Heidi Gardner? I was going, yeah, well, yeah I've heard of her. And uh, so, so I, that, but that's really, really, um, that's really, really heartening to see that the firms are taking it seriously. And law firms being... Um, what they are and very evidence-based. Heidi's work is very important because it has so much data in it and you know they need the proof now they've got the proof and now they're trying to make it happen. But we have a, um, a fantastic panel so I thought we'll move on to um, what what everybody here is going to say. You've got their bias I'm not going to ask them to necessarily introduce themselves in detail but I thought as we're you know we're, we're going to hear from them all and then we'll have some sort of q and I'll ask them some questions and I'll open it up into the, into the audience. Uh, but I thought just to kind of get us warmed up a bit, because you, you know who Heidi is, you've now got a bit of a sense of who I am, you can see their bias. But I just thought I'd ask everyone on the panel uh, just a quick question, the zipping down, uh, starting with you, Roger. Um, but actually, there's two sides to this question. One is, what's your passion? And the second one is, what gets you up and out of bed, Alan Moy? It's assuming that they're different? Or? <laughs> well... Maybe, or maybe not. So, uh, as you can see from my bio, I'm the global co-chairman of a huge global firm, probably one of the few that captured everybody's imagination 11 years ago. So for me, in being, and I, I'm sorry to say, Heidi, that the passion that gets me out of bed in the morning is not collaboration. <laughs> I know you're saddened to hear that. But for us, the most important thing was the art of the deal. And law firms were consistently not very good for themselves at the art of the deal. So if you were going to create a global law firm for the first time, the art of the deal became almost had to be your passion. And at the same time, the passion had to be developed within the cultures of the various countries that we're in. So I think for me, it's kind of the same thing. It's my passion and the thing that drives me out of bed in the morning. Great. Thank you. So, um, so I'm, I'm Mandy DiFilippo. I work at Morgan Stanley. Um, my career at Morgan Stanley has been 
almost entirely international. So um, I can definitely uh, second a lot of the comments around sort of, um, you know, and, and I'm sure we'll get into some of the issues that come up when you're doing cross-regional collaboration and um, encountering people that come from an entirely different cultural set of cultural norms and backgrounds. Um, but in terms of what gets me up in the morning, so at the moment um, I run risk for fixed income in uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa um, in the middle of a sort of what I, what I would call kind of a global vertical. So I have a, a lot of touch points and interactions with people in New York, in Asia, um, and on the ground um, where I am. And I love problem solving. So that's really what, um, that, you know, I'm, I'm sort of known as a fixer within the organization. I love that. Um, it gets as me up in the morning. As long as you're not known as a cleaner. That's right. I don't clean, <laughs> just fix. Um, and of course, um, as part of that, um, I work with um, a number of super smart, talented people um, who also also are, are incentive for me to get up in the morning. Great, thank you, Mandy. Jeff, your passion and what gets you out of bed? So I would say my passion is trying to relive my childhood through my kids. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who are here, <laughs> um, and so what gets me up in the morning? So um, I would say. Uh, so like Mandy, um, we, I work for a global financial institution and you know, we're in 40 countries um, and in each country, I'd say we have over uh, 250 regulators and you know, maybe 100 primary regulators. Even in the US we have you know, like the state banking regulator, the federal banking regulator, the securities regulator, the you know, uh, state securities regulator, the Department of Labor that you know, regulates our product. And um, what really gets me up is um, like, adding value to solving problems. We have the most complex, um, multi-jurisdictional, uh, multi-regulatory problems um, that like, like I've ever experienced in my career, um, particularly since in the, in the post-financial crisis world. And so, um, you know, we can't do it alone, so your two themes actually do resonate. Um, but, uh, um, and, and sort of trying to lead an organization that is all on the same page and trying to get through the same thing and you know, deliver products around the world. The one thing I would say is um, we do everything on scale, so efficiency and effectiveness is really important to us, which are some of the themes we're talking about. And the flip side of doing things on scale is when you screw up, you screw up on scale. And so um, it's really important to get things right. Yep. And that gets you out of bed in the morning, yeah. the fear of screwing up. That'll make me stay in bed. <laughs> <laughs> and season. Okay, so uh, I'm passionate about a lot of things, but there's been something that's uh, been getting a, a higher share of my passion over the last several years. And it started with uh, a couple of years ago, I took, um, I, I was chairman and CEO, I, I decided to give up my CEO role so I could spend some more time doing something that I want to do for the rest of my life when I finally leave my company, which I don't know when that will be. But, And I became a Harvard Fellow in the Advanced Leadership Institute. And uh, I did that because I wanted to work on uh, this project and take a little time to do that. So uh, I kind of negotiated be between uh, Cambridge and and Manhattan, and my project comes from the work I've been doing uh, for m all of my career, which is I've been p a personal witness to the power of creativity and ideas to turn around businesses, to change courses, mm -hmm. to drive commerce, to solve problems, and I've also been a chair of things like the Ad Council, which is the largest um, maker of public service announcements, so I've seen it also be a force for good. Imagine if just the top 20 advertisers who spend billions of dollars in the US in advertising took just 1% of their paid media spend and embedded in their messages, in their commercial messages, embedded a social change message that was relevant to their brand, authentic to their brand, not a separate corporate, uh, um, not, a, not a separate, um, uh, public service announcement, not corporate social responsibility, but literally embedded in your brand. And they did it because doing good is good for business. So I've been working on this project with a bunch of clients around the, the world who are passionate about this to try to advocate for that and get the top advertiser in the worst word, world to do, to pledge 1% of their advertising to do, to embed in their message a social, a social change message. So that's my current passion. 
Wow, that's fantastic. So I think we get a sense of um, who our panellists are going to be. And we've got, we've got some lawyers that have worked in private practice and then moved into in-house roles. Um, and we've got the chair of a major, major global law firm and the chair of a major sort of corporation. So we've got a number of perspectives. And of course, Heidi, who's got, who's got the academic framework. So I was going to ask, um, uh, I, I might sort of uh, kick off with you, actually, Mandy. Um, I was going to ask you all just to make sort of three of your high level kind of insights into um, collaboration in your organizations, how you see it working, um, and what you see the big obstacle is. Okay. So, um, so look, in investment banking is, is in, in a way, by definition, a collaborative, um, a collaborative endeavor in that, um, you know, I, I think every single transaction we work on is staffed with cross-divisional teams. Um, I think everybody recognizes that in order to deliver what clients need, even uh, you know, sort of a basic securities offering involves people from different teams with different expertise. So you, have, you might have sector teams who understand the company and their, um, you know, and, and, and sort of the sector they're in and, and kind of what space they occupy. You'll have people that understand um, the capital markets. You'll have people from sales and trading who understand the investor base that you're gonna sell securities to. So we're very used to that concept. I think what, what is difficult um, is, you know, kind of capturing the additional value add that we're looking for in terms of intelligent collaboration. I think what I'm talking about is probably, you know, for lack of a better term, more cookie cutter collaboration, i.e. on paper we're collaborating, but are we really doing it in a way that is, you know, is truly differentiating? And when I think about what would be differentiating, um, I think about innovation. So um, one of the things that we strive for as an organization is to provide innovative solutions to clients because let's face it, I mean, again, in banking, uh, our clients are very sophisticated, okay? They know most of the time at least the basic gist about what they're looking for. Um, and so in order to make sure that we continue to serve the clients that we want to serve and give them what, what you know, not only what they need but also get some of their business, we need to be innovative. And I think um, that's one of the reasons why I would say um, this, you know, the idea of collaboration, you know, being a fad and so forth, it's not. I mean, this is something that we're all trying actively to capture. Um, you know, like I said, I, th we, I come from a place where collaboration is valued. Um, we have a really collaborative culture. Um, there's a lot of cross-divisional working. We are committed to mobility. A lot of things that really do foster this kind of working together. But at the same time, capturing that value is tough. Why is it tough? I sort of see three reasons why. Number one, I work in a really big organization. It might not be as big as some people's organizations, but it's really big. Um, when it's really big, that means there's a lot of people. And when you have a lot of people, not everybody knows each other. And I think it's really hard to get people to work together in, a, in, a, in this kind of a way when they don't know each other. And so I think that's, a, quite frankly, problem number one. Problem number one is our organization is global. Okay, global, and, and I mentioned this, it's vast, spans lots of geographies, lots of regions and countries. So you have a lot of cultural differences to work through. Um, I, and I, I mentioned before, I've worked in all three major regions, um, at least in the way we think about it, which is sort of Americas, Europe, and Asia. And I can tell you, doing business in those three places, even today, in this global era, is quite different. And I think that's something that can prevent people from collaborating effectively. And then I think the third thing I think about is, although you know we're, we're this vast organization and it's really big, we're actually still an organization of individuals. This is a service industry. Um, it's a people business, and um, you know each of these individuals are individually compensated based on individual performance. So um, you know the key, and, and again coming from banking. Um, you know, the key is everyone's looking for metrics. So what's an, what's an accurate metric to be able to measure behavior and incentivize it appropriately? And, you know, it's really easy to do that based on certain types of quote-unquote objective units like the billable hour or the, you know, um, for us it's, you know, sort of how much business did, you, you know, did your client bring in, et cetera, et cetera. But it's quite hard to actually come up with something that pinpoints that, you know, that sort of value creation from effective collaboration. So I think those are the three things 
um, that I would say are, um, are, I don't know about obstacles, but things that we need to work through in order to achieve, achieve the goals that Heidi has set out. And, and Mandy, to, to react to that, what's interesting is we've conducted surveys across thousands of professionals to ask them exactly this question. What prevents collaboration to be you know, smoother, more frequent, more effective, and so forth? And one of the strongest obstacles that comes up across organizations is trust. But what we found fascinating is that trust means two really different things. Um, there's confidence trust. So I might not want to bring somebody into my project if I don't know that they're perfect technically, right? If I'm worried about them making some kind of an error or technical mistake, that level of, of mistrust about their competence is really going to prevent <clears throat> me. Or it could be their professional competence. Are they going to be as responsive to my client as I need them to be and those sorts of things? Um, but there's also interpersonal trust. And I think across cultures, sometimes this can be even harder to establish. It's just so natural to have kind of in-groups and out-groups when you can identify them by culture and language and all sorts of things that makes collaboration in those ways trickier. So I think organizations, no matter how large or small they are, as soon as they start to span regions, uh, are facing those kinds of issues. And as soon as they grow up through the art of the deal and mergers and, and acquisitions, then they're gonna be facing the um, other kinds of trust as well. So, Roger, you're in a huge global law firm, um, used to be one of the biggest in the world. Uh, what is your take on collaboration? Why is, why is it so important for you now? What are the obstacles? So, um, I, th I think you have to start with a sort of a, a contextual framework of what the industry is like. So, the industry is a very mature industry, the law firm industry. Um, in that it's growing probably at one to three percent a year and as a result of that the levels of differentiation requirements grow because you're not getting an expanded pie you got to take market share away from other people and your biggest competitors may also be your clients who are constantly poaching from you in one way or another the second thing is that law firm's architecture is very staid and has been staid for a long period of time. It tends to be extremely vertical. There were practice groups and they, everything was measured by practice group performance. It's only relatively recently that sector expertise has become such a big deal, in part because clients have said, listen, I'm not hiring you unless you know my business as well as I know my business. And so, as a result of that, now you've got another vertical. You've got the sector vertical. And now you have the practice group vertical. So the biggest struggle for a law firm leader is to create horizontal collaboration. And it's not only horizontal collaboration from practice group to sector, it's practice groups to sector. And then when you add on to that the various cultures that Mandy and everybody has been talking about, it becomes a multi-dimensional, you know, three, it would be nice if it was only three-dimensional chess. It's probably like 12-dimensional chess in an effort to get people to see that to the extent that they collaborate horizontally, it's going to accrue to their personal advantage as well as the advantage of the, of the overall enterprise because we know from our own empirical data that to the extent that one has more practice groups, more sectors, more geographies, more offices involved, the likelihood is obviously that you have greater market share and penetration into the client, and as a result of that, you will, you will lar largely be more successful. The other thing I'll say about it is it's absolutely, the collaborative aspect of it is absolutely the most critical point in attracting good talent. Talent management may be, other than you know, horizontal or whatever kind of smart collaboration, the most important thing that we do. And included in that talent management is having an approach towards diversity and inclusion that differentiates us from every other large organization. Because our numbers are fine, because they're compared to other numbers that are also fine, but they're not really driving a path for people to really feel like they can succeed in the way I succeeded. And so when you think about all these things together, there's a vast amount of collaboration, particularly that has to go on 
in a global firm with, uh, with very different cultures and architecture. And do you feel that you are successfully collaborating? Um, I think we are because I think people largely came, you know this as well as anybody knows this, having been there, I'm not saying anything about you know what, but you've been there from the very <laughs> beginning of DLA. I mean, people came to DLA because they could not get to where they aspired to be at their firm of origin. They wanted something bigger. They th saw a global framework. There weren't that many global firms out there in 2005. So we were the kind of the new kids on the block. Everybody thought we were going to blow up in two years, for sure. Um, and honestly, I came in 2007. If I knew then what I if I knew then what I know now, I'm not sure I would have done it actually. <laughs> but um, the proof of it was that the world was ready for globalization. So people say to me all the time, in the face of particularly the political environment that we're now in. I have to be the world's biggest globalist. I am among the world's biggest globalists because our firm, the validation of the proposition of the global firm is based on me being a globalist. And it's pretty clear that there are a bunch of partners in the firm that came from the regional firms that aren't globalists. And as a result of that, they will eventually wash out over time because they will no longer see their future as being congruent with ours. And that includes collaboration, includes diversity and inclusion, includes talent management, includes all those things. So lots of challenges coming down the line. So I'll, I'll move to you, Susan, if you can tell us what, from your experience at Publicis, what collaboration Okay, well, I, like you. Roger, I'll put a, give a little bit of context first. Um, many of you uh, probably got your impression about advertising agencies from watching episodes of Mad Men, right? Uh, and, and that may have been what advertising was like in the 50s, 60s, maybe even a little bit in the 70s when things were simpler, but it certainly hasn't been true for the last several decades. For me, my entire career has been marked by change, uh, cataclysmic change in the industry. When you think about uh, the influence of globalization, the fragmentation of the media, think about media choices expanding, think about uh, the World Wide Web, you know, and, and, and how that's changed everything and the wild proliferation of choices that people have. You know, people are in charge of their own media these days. It's kind of useful uh, to, to see the complexity we're, deal we're dealing with if you contrast even just the language of the Mad Men era with today. So think about um, in the Mad Men era, there were people thought about television, they thought about print, they thought about radio, they thought about networks and channels, and there were very few of them, and they thought about uh, their, their segment, their consumer segment, and day part. And it was all very predictable. You could reach, and it was all about reaching and persuading with your message. Today, we have mobile devices, tablets, desktop, wearable devices, search, analytics, data, content, apps, programmatic, all of the things that come very naturally and native to uh, Heidi's children there. Uh, things that uh, we've had to learn. If you think about our business channels, there are still some channels, but many, many more of them, but they've been re replaced by this thing called platforms. So YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, those are, those are platforms that are delivering content right straight to an individual consumer. So uh, forget mass messages. We can get a message to you, to an, an individual, the right content at the right time and the right place through the right channel. We, we are capable of doing that. And think about the, the complexity that that causes. So to stay on top of all this, we've had to acquire and expand our, our expertise, exponentially really. Uh, we have, we have uh, created new disciplines. It used to be, again, there was a creative ad agency and maybe a media company. Now there's still our creative, much more complex creative advertising agencies, but then there, there are PR companies, but much more complex PR companies. There are sales promotion companies, but there are all sorts of digital companies and all different types of media companies. So uh, our company is now um, over 60% of our talent around the world. We acquired Digitas, Sapient, some, some companies that some of you may know about, uh, Razorfish. We are now 61% uh, of our talent are digital specialists. Across the entire rest of the company, 
digital capability is embedded in all of the work that we do. That's a major transformation. So the other competing, for, so there's the complexity that Heidi, Heidi talks about, but the other competing and often contradictory force, which is just as strong, is the clients in solving these complex problems. They don't want the way we solve them to be complex. They want the way we solve them to, for number one, be give them all of that for less money, so more for less, and they want us to be fast, seamless, simple, agile, uh, and, and ready for the next change. So that those two competing pressures create unbelievable demand. So, so what have we done? About um, after six months of really serious reflection in the company, about a year and a half ago, involving our 300, out of our 80,000 employees, 300 of our top leaders, uh, we spent six months to really reflect on how we could not just create incremental change, but really transform the way that we work for the new era. So we, start, we did that, and, and in 20, January 2016, we launched our transformation and have been activating and implementing it since then. And collaboration is right at the heart of our ability to succeed or fail at this new mission. So the first thing we did is you need a new, to articulate your new mission. So we've moved from being a communications company to being a company that uh, aspires to be an indispensable creative partner in our clients' trans business transformations. So that's a, a huge difference. And so that requires different kinds of skills. So we did things like uh, we changed the structure. So instead of, we were very brand focused. I don't know how many of you know advertising agencies, but you typically know them by the name, uh, the brand of the agency. So Leo Burnett, Saatchi and Saatchi, maybe here in Boston you knew Hill Holiday or Arnold. Uh, they, they're, and they're fiercely independent cultures. And so brands ruled. So we've broken down the brand silos and we've, we've put the client leaders, much like the professional services firms, put the client leaders at the center of the organization. So all of like the power and the authority is now in the hands of the client leaders and not the brand leaders. We've created country and client P&Ls. So the individual brand P&Ls have gone away. The incentive system has been changed to reward behavior that benefits the country and the client, not just your individual brand, certainly at the expense of others. So we have my CEO, uh, which is, uh, sounds a little odd, but he, uh, he stood up to, uh, when he announced this to talk about we want no silos, no solos, no bozos, which kind of did capture <laughs> what he wanted. You know, it's, it's really, it's, it's a personal way of working, not just um, breaking down P&Ls. So uh, we really did restructure, but to, to drive the transformation, we had to change our people. So we've hired some new people. Uh, we've put people in new positions. We had to change how we work. That's really important with the structure and organization. We have this, uh, we're, we're pulling new teams together and they're working, people are working and want to collaborate, but we needed to create a process that helped them to get into collaboration faster. So we call it break, bond, build. So first of all, you gotta break whatever is the impediments are to your working together as a team, because they often come together and they don't even know each other. The second point is do something together. You know, spend, before you jump in and, and finish the project, go, to dinner together, do something together, get to know each other, and then build something together. So a break bond build is our. And then we did something in our 20 top offices. We have a, we completely redesigned our space. So if you come to my office in Manhattan, uh, all of our, us in New York are in one building now, you will see that uh, I don't have an office. No one has an office. And these, are, we don't have cubicles. We, it's activity-based um, planning. So we have destinations, neighborhoods, where people who work together typically ha sit at a big long table. Anybody who's been to Facebook, it's similar to their, uh, how they work. And there are loads of soft spaces around. We, nobody has, uh, we don't have landline phones. Um, we have big monitors. Uh, we're a creative industry, so we all have to work on our Macs. And we have, no, it's paperless. So at seven o'clock every night, anything that's on your little desk, we, we don't even have assigned seats. You know, you go and you sit at a table. So what that's done is it, it just drives uh, spontaneous collaboration just in a very natural way. 
And then we, we, have to, we had to do something like, this requires new tools and skills, so we've created something called Publicis Academy, which is a whole new approach to learning and development. So is it working? Uh, just in the last year, we've, we've had three really big group new business wins that are of nature <coughs> that we wouldn't have been able to get before. They're really transformational wins with USAA, with Walmart, with Citibank. Uh, with um, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, HP Enterprise, which just launched a very, very different assignment. Uh, our client reviews, clients are noticing the difference and inviting us into very different kinds of deeper, broader projects. For our talent, it's still too early to tell. They're, they're doing it, but are they changing in a fundamental way? We'll see. So. Uh, and innovations, we're seeing innovations. You know, when you bring an oral care, where we brought Sapient together with their technology expertise, our health guys together, and our brand people together, and they're coming up, they created, which, which we've shared with the client, an a smart toothbrush that is tied into, because it, 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 anybody here who looks at health knows that your mouth is te tells a lot about your overall health. You can tell your heart, uh, functioning by, by what's going on in your mouth. So it's literally, they've created a smart device uh, uh, that's linked to the simplicity of using a toothbrush. So it's, be, it's working. So I, on the question of its collaboration here to stay, I would say yes. Great. We'll go over to you, Brad. Um, Jeff, sorry, if you can uh, tell, tell us from your, your point of view at State Street, what are you are viewing collaboration within your organization? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll answer a little bit differently since <clears throat> I guess some of the last of asked these questions, I'll start by saying I agree with everybody so far. Um, the, uh, you know, I've had the um, fortunateness of uh, first practicing law in private practice and then uh, for 23 years and then going into a financial institution for another 13 years. And I'd say when I started in private practice, I entered a world and my firm was at one extreme end of the spectrum where um, they referred to it as you ate what you killed. And so we had a compensation system that if you brought the client in the door, they were your client, you got the profitability from that client, and, uh, and it never changed, no matter who you brought to the table. So instead of having a law firm of 300 lawyers, it was you know, 300 law firms all competing with each other. And you know, clients would get calls from different partners as if they never, it wasn't coordinated, um, and it was, uh, it was terrible, and at the same time, um, so I'm about, I'm about, I am 60, I know I don't look it, but I am 60, <laughs> and, um, and if you go to any law firm, within a couple of years of my age, so from 55 to 65, there'll be a line, and above the line, if you went into a corporate practice, you had pretty broad expertise, you did some securities, you did some licensing, you did some M&A, um, you, you did a whole bunch of things. Those whole bunch of things are like 10 different disciplines in a law firm today, all of which are specialized. If you blow the line, you're in one of those disciplines and you're really specialized. And so you're not as good at spotting issues or anything like that. So roll it forward. So all that has changed. Um, roll it forward. You can't get by without um, coordinating with other people. Uh, it's like you can't be the expert, like as a role of a general counsel, like I'm expert at nothing anymore. Um, as every day you see more issues in more countries and you lose your ability to stay on top of any particular area. And so you can only act through specialists. And so um, today, you know, I said, I used the words efficiency and effectiveness before. Well, you know, um, banks are going through a metamorphosis as are law firms. And um, a part of it is, you know, uh, the delivery of legal services is a cost center. So our delivery of services involves what we put together internally and what we have to hire for expertise internal, externally. And it's obviously much cheaper to do it internally if you can and you have the expertise. Quality can't be sacrificed. And so, you know, again, if we do things on scale and we screw up on scale, that, that's like an outcome that no one's willing to tolerate. And so we can't afford to have, you know, 10 creditors rights lawyers in every business unit or 10 ERISA lawyers in every business unit or banking expertise in every business unit. So we have a group at the center that these people that never met each other have to rely on. Um, and same with outside law firms. We've had problems that are so complex um, and they're in, in some cases bet the company type problems or you know big enough that you can use those words um, where 
you know, it started in the UK. We had a UK law firm. The issue spilled over to the US, and so we hired a separate US law firm instead of relying on their um, sort of partners um, in their US offices. Um, and then it was important enough to get a second opinion. We hired yet another law firm. And they all have to work e with each other. And if they don't, um, you know, the consequences are they won't work for us again. And so we've never really had that problem. Um, I, I guess I'd also say that um, when we go engage outside firms, it's our expectation that the, um, we don't really have, I mean, I guess we do have a relationship partner, but we, um, I use these terms, I don't mean it to be uh, negative, but we blow past that person relatively quickly and go to the experts in the different areas that we actually need. Um, and it's, it's the relationship partner, if we don't, uh, if we need a new area of expertise and we don't have it, it's the relationship partner to find us like the best person. And we're, we're much more comfortable getting more senior help than just parades of lawyers that are gonna do research. Again, so that we have um, expertise based on experience. Um, we actually do value industry know-how, how other people are attacking the problem. You know, um, it, we oftentimes have novel issues. Now I would say, um, you know, other financial institutions have novel issues um, and they're all different. And so they're all genuine, they're all different and they all involve the same demand for services and expertise. So um, our industry is such that uh, we just can't get by without collaboration anymore, or um, we feel like we're going to fail. It, we can always get better at it, but if if we don't, um, if we're not doing it, we're going to fail. So one of the things um, that I think uh, was puzzling me, and maybe I'll, I'll come back to 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 Susan and Mandy on this because we were speaking about this earlier. But um, you know, it seems like a very sensible thing, doesn't it? If you collaborate, it's going to be better. You know, everyone getting on. It's a very sensible thing, but actually. Why, why is it so difficult to do? And you know, why is it so painful? Well, I mean, I think, I don't know about, again, I think I would, I would emphasize that it's, it's difficult to do it well. Is, is kind of how I would put it. I think, um, you know, again, at, at our shop, there's a lot. And the reason I say that is, you know, there is definitely a kind of a cultural incentive, generally speaking, within the firm um, to deliver the firm to the client. So, and I think this is a point that was raised before. Clients are looking for not just, you know, they've got complexity and there's big problems and it's, you know, you've got big issues, but um, if you're going to avoid you know, missing, spotting the big, you know, kind of elephant in the room. Um, if you're going to deliver, sim you know, a simple um, solution that a client is going to like, you need to, de to, d to deliver a team to the client. And that's something that we look for um, in our, in the law firms that we work with. Um, you know, we don't want to, ha to kind of have to be like, okay, there's, you know, we need to spot issues for you and then tell you which specialists we want. I think we also need kind of a collective effort. So I think that's all recognized. But at the same time, I think there's still, in terms of capturing that additional value, I think there are, you know, there, there are just kind of some human principles that I think, you know, they, they operate. Um, going back to cultural differences, I mean, you know, in all of my years of working, the number of conversations I've had with people that come from different places where you're all, tr like, everyone agrees on what the goal is, and yet you sort of seem to kind of exit this conversation having made each other upset or, you know, there's some, nobody understands what we're actually trying to say, and actually, um, you know, th there's really no reason it should, it should be that way, and I think... Um, I don't know. I, I think it's it's you can't get away from the fact that it's a human you know it's a human business, and that you know I thought I thought your point was fantastic. This you know this kind of the idea that you need to sort of break and build. I mean I think you really do. And and you know coming at this from someone who has run multiple teams within an organization, I think you know and and people think of team building as a soft thing, mm -hmm. but it isn't. I mean, it is exactly what you need in order to create a team that doesn't operate the way I think somebody was talking about what I think of as the kind of the orchestra model with the conductor and everything has to go through, you know, the one person. I mean, that is totally inefficient. It's not going to work. You need a team that actually can work not just with the leader, but with them, with each other. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to build a team. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think that is, that requires effort, investment, time, and prioritization. <laughs> and I'm not sure everybody, you know, does yeah. that. So, Susan, uh, well, what do people lose when they collaborate? Yeah, I, it's a good, 
they, they do lose. It's a, that's, a, I think, a good question because everybody looks at what you gain with collaborating and then you look at what the hurdles are. And pe people talk a lot about the operational hurdles or the logistical hurdles. But one of the biggest uh, uh, areas uh, that, that gets a little compromised with collaboration has to do with personal identity. Everybody wants to belong to something, and we have a really com we're in a very competitive business. And think about any time when you're competing, you want your team to win, and the concept of team and belonging to that team is so important. Collaborating across companies, collaborating across disciplines, having to collaborate with new teams to solve a problem means you're working with people outside your home base team. And you don't have the same uh, sense of identity with those people, and it's especially true in our business. So we have to somehow uh, c kind of counter that loss of belonging and identity with some other emotional pull as being part of that team. And replacing that sense of identity and that sense of team to get people to want to fight for their newly brought together collaborative group is is really a big challenge i mean i mean that fascinates me that i mean that idea of losing belonging and identity i mean that's that's a huge thing i mean and you were talking about you know i also like the break bond build i mean can you tell us an example where you've managed to restore that sense of identity to teams or yeah what's helped a lot is uh kind of d doing it around client teams so, uh, so kind of, uh, kind of creating a new team around solving the client's problem or the client transformation. So you you have to replace it with something. So that's what's working for now. I think also I would just add, um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, to your point that people lose is the identity as as the person who solved it, the person who did it, you know, I get the glory, it's my deal, I brought it in. And I think one thing that organizations need to do and organizational leaders need to do is instead reward people for delivering their colleagues and a collective effort. And I think that's something that we focus a lot on internally. Um, it, it, you know, it's not, it can't be that it's the person delivering the deal, it needs to be that we did it. And I think it, that's something that requires organizational commitment. And that comes back to your earlier point about metrics. What kind of metrics do you use to reward collaboration? So um, conscious of the time. So shall we um, open it up to the audience? And have we got any questions from the audience for the panel or for Heidi? Yeah. So. Uh, Question for you: um, As we drive towards like the fourth industrial revolution, and there's the prevalence of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning, it seems like there's two sides of that. I mean, there are tasks that many of us would otherwise reach out to somebody else to do that are going to become automated. So on that end, you have less potentially the the less less collaboration in an organization because you're going to be depending on an algorithm to drive towards whatever the assignment is or whatever the end goal is. On the other hand pervasive technology across borders, you know, it opens up opportunities to connect. Mm -hmm. um, how does that play out? What, how does AI, machine learning, fourth industrial revolution affect that ability to collaborate? And, and what do you think the, the end goal is? Or what do you think the, how, how should organizations deal with those potential scenarios and others? Can we, can we get Heidi to answer that question? Is that right? <laughs> and then we'll throw it out to the rest of the panel. I think technology is such a broad term. We have to think about what it is that we're what what it is we're talking about. So when you think about technology, oftentimes uh, in conjunction with collaboration, many people see it as a silver bullet. Right? If we just got the right technology platform, it would be easy for us to collaborate because then we'd be able to whatever share documents and we'd be able to, to, to see each other virtually and we'd you know, br bridge some of these boundaries and so forth. And I think it's important to realize that technology is an enabler of collaboration and collaboration is a means to a different kind of an end. And so if you start with technology, again, what is it that you're trying to achieve? Right? You're trying to smooth out collaboration in order to do what? And so I think keeping the end goal in mind is, is really critical when we're talking about collaboration um, and technology interface here. But when it comes to AI, I think that's 
absolutely fascinating. Um, is it that we are going to be collaborating in the sense that I talked about earlier with a machine, right? So to the extent that um, any sort of artificial intelligence uh, truly automates what we're doing or substitutes for humans, I think that's a realm uh, in which we can consider. But most people are thinking about um, artificial intelligence these days, at least in, in the professional arena, not so much as replacing humans, but augmenting them. Mm -hmm. um, making humans, uh, taking away the, the sort of the drudge tasks that humans, you know, the routine, the, 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 the algorithmic kinds of tasks, and allowing humans to do what humans do best, which is around wisdom and judgment and empathy and connection and innovation and creativity. And I think AI could really be liberating in that sense, which gives us the opportunity to collaborate at the highest levels on the most sophisticated issues that really require that human interface, um, perhaps augmented by all sorts of insights from, from you know, artificial intelligence or other technological enablers. That's how I'm coming at this, but yeah, really I'm interested in hearing Jeff, others. Jeff, do you want to? Have a go answering that question. Sure. So um, we actually uh, are um, exploring artificial intelligence and blockchain technology and a bunch of the advanced technologies for a whole bunch of things. But at least the way we're thinking about it today, and you know, ten years time may open our eyes, or even five years time may open our eyes um, to look at it differently. Is it really will take away um, what we view as um, the low end jobs? Um, and it would take away, you know, it would make easier record keeping and things like that. But, but what's left is um, sitting on top of that are still, you know, thousands of people that have to perform functions, that have to solve problems, that uh, um, can't do it in a vacuum. They require special expertise and, um, you know, that not any one person can have. And so we're not really looking at, we're looking at it to um, create a world that's much more efficient but we don't think it's going to take away. We don't. We can't run a company with just one machine and one person controlling it. So, and Susan, I thought you know you said sixty-one percent of the organisation are now digital specialists. So you've yeah. gone through your own internal tech revolution. I mean, how would you? Ask well, that? actually, when typically when you think about AI and, uh, and underpinning your question a little bit was the loss of, of human jobs, but. In a creative industry, it has opened up, it just unleashed creativity. So I won't uh, point to them now, but we have a myriad of examples where we've been working with augmented reality for brands to create whole new opportunities to uh, to entice and, and, and engage consumers. So I don't know, some of you have saw, seen maybe, um, I don't even know the manufacturer, they, um, their, children's, uh, their, their children's linens that have characters some of the favorite children's um, characters, and through your iPhone, uh, the lens of your iPhone, the characters on your linens, on your beds, come to life and interact and talk to you. That's, <laughs> may, you know, that maybe not doesn't sound exciting to you, but it, the, the kids love it. But that's an example of Don't the creative ideas. possibilities <laughs> uh, of this new technology. So it just opens up opportunities for people to collaborate who never would have collaborated on, uh, on behalf of a creative project. Great. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Sure. I'll ask one. Um, so first of all, this is fascinating. Um, I guess I'd like to ask uh, about maybe the dark side of collaboration. Uh, because, you know, collaboration, I think, and you mentioned this, Heidi, it's now become kind of a word where it's sort of motherhood and apple pie. And, uh, but we know that actually there are a lot of things that could be dangers of collaboration, like groupthink. So when you talk about redefining identity, so how is that, you know, what, how do you think about what are the identities that you want and what are the identities you don't want? When Roger says, how do we think about working in a more diverse and inclusive way, that's good, but a lot of times when we think about collaboration, actually where it's been, it's us versus them. Or when you talk about relationships between internal collaboration and collaboration with external people, where like those external people called clients, some of whom we have actually on the panel. Uh, and I bet clients would think that a lot of times what they worry about is that actually what happens is that the law firm is so busily focused on its internal collaboration, like its profitability, that it gets in the way of their collaboration 
uh, with clients. So, uh, you know, I guess I'd be interested in having the panel reflect a little bit about how they think about what the dangers of various kinds of collaboration are and how they try to guard against it to, to bring out the positive. So, Roger, should we get you to answer that? Yeah, I actually, David, I, I think the dark side is more easily manageable than the, it is to make the positive side of it work. Um, the problem, the, it's a much bigger problem to have people that are completely marking themselves to market every day than it is to force people into a collaborative framework that is for the, com that is for the common good. And the question I think Mandy rightly asked is, where leaders of major institutions have failed and failed miserably is because you're focused on the top line or your profitability and it's very hard to go with those people that are marking themselves to market and are, and are big producers and maybe lousy collaborators. And so how do you, how do you punish them, in effect, for the failure to abide by what the rules are or what the established mores are of the institution? And I would be, I mean, I, I cannot believe Mandy would disagree with me. There are a bunch of people, I mean, I know that there are a bunch of people at Morgan Stanley that do not collaborate and basically march into the chairman's office and say, this is what I, this is what I delivered and this is what I expect to make. And all those people were very important to the overall productivity of whatever the project was or whatever the matter was. But in the end, but for me, this wouldn't have happened. But do you see a dark side to collaboration, as um, David was suggesting? I don't. I, re I, really, I really don't see this kind of dark side to it. What I see is an overemphasis where you become so enamored with it as a topic mm. that it ends up, um, uh, you, you expand to the point where you're not necessarily getting the best skills of the organization. Yeah. I mean, I would say, sorry, just to That's jump true. in. I, I think I completely agree. And I think um, the only downside that I see is when collaboration is not done well or effectively. So um, to, to me, what you lose sometimes when you have, especially when you're having to build these broader teams, is accountability. And um, you know, when you lose accountability, what you end up with is these amorphous groups of people that are sort of discussing, you know, I think everybody's been in these kinds of meetings, right? Which is, I mean, these are the kinds of meetings where you're like, I'm never gonna get that hour back ever. Um, you know, where it's this sort of endless, right? You're all around a table and you know, so forth. And at the end of the meeting, nobody really knows if they've gone anywhere. Not, no one's really sure what the deliverables are. Not really sure, you know, sort of where we're going. And, but that's okay because everyone can't get can't wait to get out of there, and so nothing actually gets done, right? And that's, that's a failure of accountability, and to my mind, a failure to collaborate effectively, rather than a problem with collaboration as a concept. And so, you know, I think it really is, it, it's a matter of making sure that what we're after is not just the tick the box collaboration, but rather that, you know, intelligent collaboration that really gets you to that value add. Mm -hmm. Jeff? Yeah, I was going to say that um, there's, zero dark side to collaboration, but there are reasons why collaboration fails. And, um, you know, it's everything from not having a professional challenger in the group to not having everyone vested in the outcome to, you know, everyone has competing priorities and, you know, um, there's the group think, there's not wanting to offend somebody, um, you know, respecting hierarchies. Um, there's, uh, you know, I have, I have um, 57 things, tell me what's important. I can't spend this hour doing that because I'm never gonna prepare for that meeting. I'll throw in my thoughts and I'll go away. And so I, I do think um, there are ways to try to ensure that uh, collaboration um, is successful. But I do think once you try to break down those barriers, um, I do think you, know, you, you may not get the perfect answer and you may not get um, a good answer, but it's probably the best opportunity to get a good answer. So I, Susan. Have, I definitely have a, uh, a dark side worry about collaboration. I believe in it and I think the benefits outweigh the disadvantages, but we, 
our business and our culture thrives on entrepreneurship. And if you think about the startup culture, I have a big worry that disproportionate emphasis on collaboration could undermine the best of what we know about entrepreneurship. It's a concern. It's not, I'm thinking it through, but that's the dark side I worry about. David, does that, does that answer your question adequately, or are you trying to get at something else? Never adequately. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. I just think any concept, if you can't think about what its dark side is, then there's a risk that the concept then becomes something that doesn't have any more bite to it. I, I, I think, think that's Susan's point yeah. is a very good one. When I think about it from our own research into innovation, uh, you know, collaboration is a critical driver. But if I look back over 12 years and of researching and analyzing innovation and professional services, um, the real driver has been individuals in law firms, senior partners, general counsel, heads of practices who've actually been the most effective mm -hmm. innovators. But I think if I may, I think it goes back to an account, the accountability point. So there's all, there always needs to be someone whose job it is to deliver. You can't have, you know, and, and this is, again, sort of with a client team. There need to be key people that are, you know, that's their job is to essentially go back and it's like that's the person or those are the two people. And I think if the organization, I, I feel that organizations should be able to culturally adjust so that you don't lose yeah. the, you know, you're able to kind of pair that with you know so that you don't lose the sense of entrepreneurship and you don't you don't lose that sort of get up and go quality that you really want completely agree though that that is you know it's always a risk again just like the amorphous endless meeting around the table with no direction i think there's a different side of uh, a different dark side of collaboration that i've seen which is uh, because of those trust issues that we talked about earlier, the instinct is um, there are two kinds of people that I could imagine bringing into my project, two kinds of people I will automatically trust. One is the mini me, yeah. right? And so somebody who is exactly like me and with the best of intentions, right? If I think, you know, my client loves me, therefore they will love somebody who is exactly like me, just 15 years younger. Right? There, there's that risk of the mini me, or the other kind of person I'm most likely to trust is the sort of Yoda. Right? So then let me go to the guru. And then you find that there is a guru who is uh, the guru for everyone and is overtapped and overworked and overstretched. And, and I think that can be a real risk as well. And so the, the way to counter that is to put some kind of accountability into the organization. We ran an effort in one organization. Uh, it wasn't a formal program, but we made people aware of what some of these patterns looked like and who was actually collaborating and how overstretched some people were. I described it as a, a market that economists could never explain because there was excess demand, everyone needed expertise, but there was excess supply of all these up and comers who had expertise, who weren't getting tapped for the opportunities and the market just wouldn't clear. Um, and so we started an initiative in an organization and just got people to think about the second person they would ask. So, so the, there's always an obvious suspect. And then don't ask that person, find the next person, or only use that person to find the second person. It's, uh, it's not initially as efficient, right? Because it takes the second phone call. But once people build up the, the cohort of, of up and comers who are hungry for those opportunities, are building their skills, they're more loyal to the people, that kind of, um, uh, of a uh, networked organization then can really unleash a lot of potential. But there is a, 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 a dark side that if people automatically collaborate with the ones who are either the mini-me's or the Yodas, that it becomes uh, a collaboration amongst an elite and the rest are sort of left behind. So it goes to um, Mandy's point, there's good and bad collaborations, or effective and not so effective collaborations. So one, one last question and then I think we have to stop. <coughs> I, I, I actually think that team building is something that is not generationally driven. I think there are certain people that have had the experience of either being on some kind of team 
where they've had to rely on other people in critical moments. Investment banks in particular talk about it a lot and their, and their recruiting scenarios very often are driven by some of that kind of experience, particularly at the entry level because people are really used to it. And you can also see it in legal education. Uh, I would say 20 years ago, yeah. nobody, nobody really thought about team building. You had kind of really kind of odd anecdotal team building. Now law schools have really adopted business school models in a lot of respects for this stuff because they understand that institutionally that it's, it's the only way really to gain the maximum amount of talent at the right levels in order to drive whatever the project is and, and allow the person who probably is the team leader, let's use that term, who has the overall accountability to feel that they can do distributive decision making kind of down there so that the number two or three person that Heidi is talking about actually gets, ultimately gets the opportunity. But without this distributive decision making down the line, it's not likely to happen. I, I actually, I have seen a, um, a very big difference in generations, but the millennials in particular and, and the generations that follow them and their use of social media, if you expand your definition of collaboration, meaning reaching out to other people for ideas and input, the uh, millennials are always sharing ideas, getting input, uh, crowdsourcing was driven by the behavior of you know, throwing out uh, on Facebook, has anybody done, does anybody have advice for this? So they'll reach way beyond their, uh, their, their location-based circle uh, to a broader social net net uh, for input, and that's the definition of collaboration. And a very positive one. I think we've uh, now sort of run out of time, so I want to say thank you to the panelists, of course, to Heidi and David for, for hosting us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So I just, again, it was a terrific example of collaboration we just had, and we get to collaborate over some uh, drinks and hors d'oeuvres, so I hope you'll stick around. And there are also books in the back, so, and I think there's lists for those of you who are lucky enough to have received the book, and if you haven't, you should buy 10 copies. That's, I'm her agent. Thank you. Oh,